Um, first of all, let me introduce Daphne Kohler. It's really a great honor for me to introduce her today to you. Um, she's, uh, as many of you know, a machine learning star, but she's also an incredible achiever. Recipient of numerous awards, nominated among the most important people, most influential people, and game changers by the likes of Newsweek and Time magazine. Uh, as many of you know also, she co-founded Coursera, and she wrote the book on probabilistic graphical models. Um, and finally, she wants to take advantage of machine learning to revolutionize healthcare. Let us welcome her. So, um, Daphne, you, you have uh, a very interesting and unusual trajectory in your career. So maybe you can start by uh, uh, telling us a little bit about it. Okay. Um, I started out like I think many of you in this audience, um, just loving machine learning and um, both in terms of the technical rigor that it allows and in terms of what it can accomplish. Uh, and I was doing that for a long time and thought that that would be where I would um, continue my career. Over time, I became more and more interested not just in the mental gymnastics of machine learning, but also in actually implementing uh, change in the world using machine learning techniques. And so I became more applied over time. Um, I started to work in computational biology and computational health long before it became popular. So back in uh, 99, 2000, uh, initially it was because those were just cool data sets that had richer structure and more interesting problems than what we had to deal with back then, which was pre-MNIST. Uh, and then over time, I just became excited about the opportunities that it opened up in terms of making impact on the world and helping us understand uh, fundamental problems in human health. Um, at the same time, I also became, I think, somewhat less... Uh, I don't know, optimistic about the ability to affect meaningful change in terms of reaching actual patients from within academia. I think it's maybe a little bit different now than it was back then, although it's still far from perfect. But the ability to get companies out there to take ideas that are developed in academia and really see them through to the point that they actually make their way into product is very difficult unless you transition people along with the ideas. Um, you d don't just ship people a paper and expect that to work. And I saw that most clearly in the work that I did with my former PhD student, Andy Beck, who then went on to become a professor at Harvard. We wrote what was, I think, arguably the first digital pathology paper. This was back in the days pre-deep learning. I know it's hard for many of you to imagine that pre-deep learning existed. Um, it was, I mean, it existed, but it wasn't the, you know, where it is today. And so we were using standard computer vision techniques to look at computational, to look at images of uh, breast cancer pathology, microscopic images. And we were able to show even with the relatively simplistic techniques that we were employing that if you took a completely data-driven approach that didn't have any preconceptions about what was important and what wasn't and didn't just look at the stuff that pathologists were looking at, that um, two things came out of that. First of all is that we were able to diagnose much better than your average pathologist um, by a fairly significant margin. And second uh, was that the features that pathologists had been looking at were really not the right ones. They were looking at features of the tumor cells because naturally that made sense, that's where the action was. Turns out that the environment that surrounded the tumor cells was actually even more indicative of what was going to happen to the patient than the tumor itself. Now today I think a lot of people recognize that, hence all the conversation about what we now call tumor microenvironment, um, but back then it was a fairly new thought. So we said, wow, this is really cool and really important, and cancer patients are getting misdiagnosed every day, so let's take those ideas and try and convince someone to bring that into clinical practice. And it just didn't work. And then Andy went off and became a professor at Harvard and tried to do it there, and it didn't work either. So, so why, why was it so difficult? Um, it's hard. Uh, you, you know, there needs to be an internal champion within a company to take something like that into practice, and a lot of the companies have, you know, siloed interests and they have their own trajectory and they're not necessarily looking for new ideas from the outside. 
Andy, by the way, eventually gave up and ended up leaving Harvard and forming his own company to try and do that um, himself because he realized that was really the only way to get it to practice. So, anyway, I'm, I'm going to pause because I think we're going to get to some of the other that's, topics later. That's fine. Um, so, so, actually, related to what you're talking about, uh, on the one hand, uh, you're saying that it's been difficult for researchers and machine learning researchers in academia to have an impact in uh, healthcare. Uh, can you tell us a little bit from the other side, like big pharma mm -hmm. and so on, you know, what's, uh, what do you think about their chances of taking advantage of machine learning? <laughs> and you want me to do this on camera? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, let's we see. don't need to name people. We're not going to name anybody. Um, I think that there is a significant cultural, cultural barrier to success in general in the integration of machine learning and the life sciences, and it's even more predominant in most big pharma companies. Um, these are two communities with extremely different ways of thinking, very different vocabularies, and a huge barrier to entry on either side in terms of just the amount of knowledge that you need to acquire. So even if you take two groups of people, biologists and you know, machine learning people, and they're both extremely eager to collaborate, you put them in a room and tell them, work together, they might as well be talking Thai and Swahili to each other. It's just very different uh, mindset. Um, so that's already a problem, even if everyone is already with the goal of collaboration. Add on top of that that most pharma companies are not actually geared for that. There is the science silo of people sitting there coming up with scientific experiments based on whatever hypothesis they have. They generate a data set rarely in consultation with anyone computational. Then they throw it over the wall to the bioinformatics group and say, please analyze this for me and send me back the results. That's not a culture that encourages the kind of experimental design that really drives forward um, innovative machine learning techniques. Um, and I think that is a cultural and structural barrier that I'm not going to say is impossible to overcome, but it's certainly going to be difficult. Mm. So, so speaking of uh, this uh, gap between biological research and, 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 and development, on one hand, and machine learning um, researchers. Uh, let's say, uh, let's say I have some PhD students who are interested in mm -hmm. applying machine learning to healthcare and, and biology. What what would be your advice for them? So first of all, I'm glad that there are such students because we need more of them. The number of people who are bilingual in these two disciplines is incredibly small and they are incredibly valuable because if you're going to form an organization that actually does both and applies machine learning to things other than you know advertising and e-commerce and image recognition to something that I think has really fundamental implications to human health you do need people who sit in the middle and speak both languages so I would say to your students um, really try and learn the vocabulary of the other um, of the other side, try and take some classes, read some papers, and really important as in any interdisciplinary area is first of all to treat the other side with respect. They, um, they think differently from you, it doesn't mean that they're less intelligent, it just means they have a different set of techniques and a different set of ideas that they bring to the table, so be open-minded to listen to their perspective. Don't be afraid to sound stupid by asking stupid questions because you bring your own expertise to the table. So it's okay for you to sound stupid when you don't know um, the stuff that the other side knows. And I've asked so many stupid questions of biologists, it's ridiculous. I think it's okay. But really, treating both sides with respect is important. So if you come into the conversation with, we're really smart machine learning people, we're gonna replace you that's a very bad starting point for a dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Um, so related to my previous question, I guess you get those questions and I get those questions. Uh, I'm curious to know how you answer uh, those uh, young people who are coming to us and asking, uh, you know, what, what, how, how should I choose my career path? What, what research directions should I be looking at? Uh, what, what do you tell them? Yeah. So I can tell you what, guide, what has guided me for many, many years, which is how much impact can I bring to the world? 
Um, so when I look back on my life, you know, whenever that is, I want to know that I've left the world a better place for my being there. And for me, and it's different for every person, for me it's not just how much value I've brought, but even more so how much value I bring relative to what would happen if you were to take me out and put in someone else. So if I do something and it might be valuable, but there's 500 other people who could do that same thing as well or better, then maybe that's not the ideal thing for me to be doing. What I want to do is things where I can bring in the maximum value in a somewhat unique way. And in some ways, that's what keeps drawing me back to this intersection between biology slash health and machine learning, because as we just discussed, the number of people who are genuinely bilingual in these disciplines is a very, very small number, and yet is a, it is a crying need um, to bring machine learning and big data techniques to a field that really hasn't benefited from them very much up until now. And so I think that's sort of um, a guiding principle. And I think the other part of that is don't be afraid to do something big. Uh, if I, people often ask me, what do you regret about your career? And I think the one thing I maybe regret the most is not having tried to do something as big as Coursera earlier in my career. Um, and I think that's something that just take on a really big, important challenge. Very few people regret having tried something and failed. A lot of people regret not having tried. So tell us more about Coursera. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, what, what you're most proud of uh, or the things that you would have... Uh, wished be done differently. Yeah. So Coursera kind of came on me unexpectedly. It was never part of the sort of charted career path that I had. I'd always had education as kind of like a side interest of mine. You're not supposed to really care about education as a professor. <laughs> so, so I always done this kind of on the side. And then the work that I'd done on trying to make education at Stanford better using technology suddenly became together with work that had been done by colleagues like Andrew Ng and Sebastian Thrun and others kind of coalesced into this um, eruption of the MOOCs back in the fall of 2011, the massive open online courses. And when we saw that each of those courses that we just launched as an experiment had 100,000 people in them or more. And not just numbers, it's like the, these are people from every country, every age group, and every walk of life, and people who would never have access to a Stanford quality education using um, the op opportunities that were available to them. So I kind of said, okay, well, I have to see this through. I can't just assume that someone will take this on and make this happen. Remember what I talked about in terms of the pathology. So since the only way to do transfer is via warm bodies, I sacrificed what I what was then my research agenda, put it on hold for what was supposed to be a two-year leave of absence from Stanford, and went and, together with Andrew, founded Coursera. Um, two years came to an end, and I decided that I really needed to stay at Coursera longer to see it through, because it wasn't quite ready for me to leave. So I ended up having to resign my Stanford position and, and stay at Coursera up until um, the summer of 2016. Um, so what I'm the most proud of I'm going to start with the other side, what, I'm, what I wish I'd done differently, and I'll end on a high note. Um, the stuff that I wish I'd done differently is I'd never had a startup. I'd never been in industry. I'd been in academic my entire life. I knew nothing. It was, it's almost pathetic today to think about all the mistakes that we made at the beginning of the company. And I wish I had recruited someone more senior who had been there, done that, not necessarily more senior, someone who had more experience with industry and startups and would help, have helped us avoid a lot of the mistakes that we made at the beginning. Um, so hire, if you're doing a startup, hire people who complement you in skill set. The thing that I'm the most proud of are the lives that we've touched. Now, I know many of you here in the audience have been touched by Coursera and, or other online education opportunities and maybe were drawn to machine learning by having had that. I'm proud of you, or have, proud of having enabled that, but I'm even more proud of the people who are not in this room and will never be in this room, like this woman in Bangladesh 
who ran away with a friend because her friend was about to be sold into indentured servitude, um, which happens a lot in Bangladesh. And they started a bakery, but the bakery wasn't making it because neither of them knew how to run a business. And she found out through Coursera how to run a business. And she took classes from Michigan and, and Wharton and others and learned how to make her bakery a success to the point that it has now employing 10 people, um, many of whom would have been sold, 10 women, most of whom would have been sold into indentured servitude. Every week at Coursera at All Hands, we read a learner's story. A lot of those stories were like this one from Bangladesh, or a man from Nigeria, um, or a disabled boy from the United States who would never have had an opportunity to have a traditional educational experience. And we transformed lives. And that is the thing that I'm the proudest of. Speaking of helping women, mm -hmm. um, how has it been for you as a woman researcher and mm -hmm. also in industry, um, given you know the, the male world in which we live? Yeah. So we've been hearing a lot about this recently, um, and it's really amazing to see, amazing both in a positive and in a sad way to see this coming out. Personally, I have to say I've been one of the lucky ones. I haven't experienced some of the more egregious of the behaviors that we're hearing about right now. Maybe because when I started out in machine learning, it was a much smaller community and there wasn't quite as much of the behavior that we're hearing about. I don't know, but at least I can say for myself, I've been fortunate. However, a lot of the other aspects that we don't talk about very much yet because those, the, the sexual harassment and abuse are so much more uh, important to take care of first. A lot of those other things I've experienced all the time. So um, those little subtle sort of insults and, and derogatory comments and sort of being relegated as a second class citizen happens to women all the time at all levels. So I'll give one example. I could stand here for this entire talk and give nothing but examples of this, but I'll give one of my favorites is when I was at Coursera and I was introduced to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, uh, very big, and it was clearly introduced as Daphne Kohler, co-founder, CEO of Coursera. Um, and I replied saying, it's very nice to meet you. I look forward to our meeting. And my assistant, James, will be in touch to coordinate a meeting. And the response back from his assistant was, dear Daphne, can you confirm James's availability for this and that date? And this is... It's not funny. It's not funny, but, but it's true. And it happened all the time. It happened to me at Stanford with male colleagues. I would be going to a meeting with a male colleague and I would be asked to confirm scheduling. Um, we would constantly have emails referred to, when, you know, to, to, to myself and to a male colleague, colleague as Dear Professor So-and-so and Daphne. And it's like, I don't mind being called Daphne, but the contrast was jarring. Um, and then the other aspect, of course, is when you're sitting in a room full of people, all of whom besides you are male, and you say something, and no one pays attention. And like three minutes later, a male colleague says the exact same thing. It's like, John, what a great idea. And what do you say? I said that three minutes ago? It sounds terrible, right? It sounds like you're constantly trying to get credit. Or do you let it go? That's the other option. That's not great either. And it's just there's no good answer in these situations. And it happens. For those of you in the audience who are women, how many have had that happen to you? Uh, lots of hands. Not that many women, unfortunately. Well, but Speaking of which, there are not enough women here. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestion of how we can uh, move things in a better direction? And, and I don't know, uh, maybe reflecting also on what you've seen at Stanford or in other places that might have worked. I think one of the things that could help, uh, let me tell you, say two things that could help. One is when you see some of the behaviors that I talked about. I'm not just talking about the super egregious ones like the sexual harassment and the groping, but even those subtle things. Speak up. It's really hard for the woman to speak up, but it's a lot harder, a lot easier for you. <laughs> so
So say something. Say, you know what? Jane said that three minutes ago, and I think it's a really terrific idea. It's a lot easier for you to do that. The second thing is, I think partly as a community, we've moved into an area that becomes much more about, I'm hoping not to insult anyone, but narrow papers that have a lot of really cool mental gymnastics in them, the cool new algorithm, the cool new technique, and those are important. But sometimes there's other papers that are not, don't have quite as much cool mental gymnastics, but solve a really important problem. Maybe using simple ideas. It's ideas that someone else has already come up with, and you just use them in a novel and interesting way, but you solve a problem that societally is important. Women tend to get drawn, I'm overgeneralizing, but I saw that at Stanford, to problems that are societally meaningful. And sometimes those problems don't call for the fanciest solution, and trying to force a fancy solution on them isn't the right approach. Demeaning or devaluing those papers because they don't have that, I think doesn't benefit us as a community and tends to also turn away people of, of whom women are maybe a larger fraction than in other parts of the space, tend to turn away people who care about solving real problems rather than just coming up with the coolest thing. And so I think as a community, if we were more open-minded on some of these papers that just really solve important problems, maybe that would be more welcoming to a broader subset of people. So, so uh, let me return a little bit to the technical side. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you consider to be exciting directions of research for machine learning people such as we have here, um, maybe, maybe that are overlooked or um, and that you would find exciting? Mm-hmm. So I work in the area of biology and health, and I think that area has many amazing opportunities. But it's characterized by a set of problems that are, I think, in many ways less of a focus to a lot of the work that's being done here. Um, The data sets there, even the larger ones, are not large by machine learning standards. The really large ones have a few hundred thousand samples. Um, A typical one might have 10,000, like TCGA, for instance, is is one of the larger cancer uh, data sets out there. It has data from 10,000 individuals, multiple data modalities, multiple measurements for each cancer. If you think about the kind of challenges that that data set um, provides, they're very different from when you're dealing with, you know, a bunch of images. First of all, there is the heterogeneity of the samples. Each of those was collected from a different hospital, often with a different assay. That's an issue. Um, It's not very large. Um, So you need to figure out how to employ techniques such as multitask learning or transfer learning or zero-shot learning that people are starting to play around a little bit with but are not as commonplace as more standard ones. Um, there's the opportunity to bring in, I know that's considered suspect these days, but prior knowledge into the models to some extent because you have to um, ac- compensate for the lack of availability of hundreds of thousands of samples with something else that gives you power. So these are directions that I think are really important to think about. Artifacts and batch effects. We've heard about that in the context of some of the fairness work that's been done here, but it also comes up in in these other applications, small data sets, um, and so on, I just think are important directions. And so maybe as a meta answer to your question, Joshua, is if we all stopped looking at the exact same data sets that everyone else has looked at, a whole new set of challenges will immediately emerge and jump out at you as things that we should be doing. So, so tell me about your views on the particular machine learning problem of interpretability. Mm-hmm. I think interpretability is a nuanced uh, question, and one needs to, instead of jumping all over, oh, everything needs to be interpretable or nothing needs to be interpretable, it's very much a question, a, a, you know, a, a data set by data set and a problem by problem. So if you're looking to get, like, absolutely the maximal performance on whatever image recognition, 
probably matters less whether your model is interpretable. But if your goal is to work with scientists, for instance, and really help do basic, biolog basic scientific discovery, the predictions are in many cases a byproduct of understanding what it is that the model is telling you about the underlying biology. And then there's a lot of things in between where you might care about this, but only to a certain extent. So, for instance, you don't want to just, again, jump to the conclusion that everything in science requires the model to be interpretable. So, for instance, if you're trying to just make really good prediction about whether a molecule is going to bind to another molecule, it might be interesting to know why, but fundamentally, you just care about making good predictions. So you really want to think about your problem and to what extent interpretability is called for and then design your model accordingly as opposed to trying to overgeneralize on one side or the other. So I do deep learning. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first, before deep learning was deep learning. And so uh, with, with deep learning becoming more and more important, uh, what do you think about the prospect for uh, previous approaches that have been popular in machine learning? Mm -hmm. And what do you see for the future? I think it's really important to avoid a mindset of, I have an amazing hammer, so everything must be a nail. Um, I think deep learning has demonstrated value way beyond any of us, certainly myself, would have anticipated, and it's a very powerful tool for solving a certain set of problems. I don't think, sorry, it's the solution for every problem. And again, I think a thoughtful approach says, what am I trying to solve, and to what extent is deep learning the right solution? To what extent is a PGM the right solution? Maybe there's an interesting hybrid that makes sense. Um, I think, and I mentioned this earlier, that the solution, because of the success of deep learning in cases where there's large data sets available, has maybe over... The pe pendulum has swung too far, in my opinion, towards models that are largely knowledge-free. Um, and maybe there is a class of problems where models that have both data and knowledge in them are a good solution for a certain set of problems. So again, thinking outside the box, outside the current box, and looking um, to and looking at new data sets that might pose a or call for a different set of solutions than the ones that are currently the the standard. I think is something that would benefit the community. So, so there's one area which uh, sits somewhere near the intersection of. Um, uh, graphical models and also um, interpretability and also, well, deep learning, I think, can play an important role, and that's causality. Do you have something to say about this? Yes. Um, causality is actually really important. It's certainly important when you think about um, biology and the problems that it tackles in terms of if most of those problems are interventional. If I give this drug to a patient, Will they become better? That is a causal question intrinsically. It's not the question, it's very different from the question of this drug was given to this set of people, did they become better? That is really not a causal question because there's so many confounders in that in terms of the doctor who decided to prescribe this medication, the, the, the extent to which uh, the patient stuck to the regimen, compliance and so on. There's just so many artifacts on that. Um, the population of people who got access to doctors who prescribed uh, the, the sort of more efficacious medication. Maybe they're just the ones who are better off to begin with because they're richer and better and more privileged. There's just so many confounders that you'll never be able to correct for using a purely observational analysis. So I think that's an area maybe is another important answer to your previous question the community hasn't devoted enough energy to. All right, thank you. Uh, I would like now to open the, the floor for uh, questions. So uh, there'll be, uh, as usual, people with uh, microphones. Yes, here. Thank you. Uh, if you could, I'll, I'll use the term wave a magic wand, um, to actually expect a, a biomedical institution to um, sort of meet the machine learning community uh, at least in the middle, what, um, what suggestions would you have? I think that's a terrific question. I'm actually glad you asked that because one of the things I didn't get to talk about with Yoshua is what I'm doing next. 
Um, and I think one of the things that really has hampered progress is that scientists design data sets and experiments to their purpose. And those are often very good purposes, but it doesn't necessarily serve the needs of building really good machine learning models that might solve problems in a completely different way, might come at the problem in a completely different way. So I think what is really valuable is to take those two groups, put them in the room and say, what are the really important problems that you wish you had a magic wand and would like to solve? Not what is the problem that you're solving today, but what are the really big questions that you'd like? And then if we can come up with one and if there is confidence or some reason to believe that machine learning might be the right tool for that type of question, which it may or may not be. It, you know, it's, machine learning too is not the magic bullet for everything. But if there is, let's think about how to design data sets that will allow the machine learning approaches to be trained effectively and applied effectively. And this is very different from, I'm going to produce the data and you please analyze it for me. And so I think getting those two groups to work together as equal partners is an absolutely critical step towards using machine learning effectively in the biology and health fields. Can you tell us a bit more about your new venture? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so yesterday, as it happens, co actually it was coincidental, um, I launched a company um, that I'm very proud of because it tries to do exactly that. It tries to... Um, you know, in the specific area of drug discovery and development to take life scientists and machine learning people and put them together in a room and say, what are the really big questions in drug discovery that if we had a magic wand, we wish someone could solve for us efficiently? Is machine learning the right solution for that? And if so, one of the things that biologists have done amazingly in the last five years is design tools that allow us to produce data at scale. That was not the case uh, five or seven years ago when I went to Coursera. A large data set at that point was a couple hundred samples. Now biologists, by uh, virtue of miniaturization and microfluidics and robotics and automation and better cellular models and things like CRISPR um, and various measurement assays are able to create really, really large data sets at scale. But no one's using that. So for creating data for machine learning, but you could. So how does that compare with the traditional way of drug development? The traditional way of drug development is by and large very hypothesis driven. And again, I'm overgeneralizing and I know there'll be someone who says, but here we do it differently. And that's starting to happen more and more. But the way it typically happens is here's a disease that I think has a large market size and I think uh, a large unmet need. So here's the pathway that I've read in papers seems to be implicated in, those, uh, in that disease. And within that, here's the target that I think is most plausible or most druggable or whatever. So now I'm going to devise a small molecule or a large molecule that binds to that target. So it's very hypothesis-driven, very intuitive, very much based on biological knowledge, not very much based on unbiased uh, uh, data-driven exploration of a much broader set of hypotheses, which creates this weird inverted funnel, which is that most of, that in this early exploratory phase, relatively a small portion of the funding is, is devoted to this place where you have fairly large leverage of what do I pursue? And by far the bulk of the money that's spent on drug development is spent on phase three clinical trials, by which point you're pretty much just praying that whatever it is you devise actually works. What if you inverted things a little bit and put more money in the upfront exploration phase so that you might increase the success of that phase three clinical trial? Do you think we could reduce the time uh, to having drugs uh, that's, made available to people? That's the hope. I, that's the hope. But, I mean, how does that impact the, like, I, know, I heard about numbers like 10, 15 years. So some things can't be hurried, unfortunately. Human biology is what it is, and it doesn't really much matter how much you want it to go faster. If you're looking to see, does a drug stop or reduce the extent to which you get heart attacks, or does it slow cognitive decline and dementia? It takes five years for that to manifest, and you can't speed that along. 
Um, but there are certain things that you can speed. A lot of the earlier preclinical discovery still takes seven or eight years. Um, and I think those are places where you can have savings. I think even the clinical trials can be potentially sped up uh, in a variety of ways. So, for instance, if we had the right... Some of the, one of the reasons why it takes so long to do a clinical trial is it takes a long time to recruit a large population as you would need to get convincing statistical evidence that something is efficacious. But what happens if we knew up front who are the right people for that particular clinical trial and you were able to target and recruit a much smaller population and have a much larger effect size manifest hopefully over a shorter time frame. So again, I don't think you can completely shorten that 15 years to, oh, we're going to get it done in two years. That's just, a, unfortunately, a, a ridiculous hope. But there are places where you can shave off a year here, a couple years there, and maybe reduce it down from 15 to five or seven. That would already be amazing. Yeah. All right. On this, let us uh, thank Daphne Kohler, and uh, really, uh, I'm, I'm super happy to have you today here. And uh, let's let's welcome. Well, let's let's say thank you. Thank you.